Um, I'm Valerie Fletcher. I am uh, really pleased to welcome you to IHCD's first global webcast on inclusive fashion. Um, and I am uh, also pleased to tell you this is part of our series honoring Eliza Forrest K. Bromfield. And with me this morning, I have our Director of Communications uh, and Inclusive Impact, Jess Mendez. Uh, and we are not going to spend a lot of time on introductions because we've shared a lot of biographical information. We have our keynote uh, leader this morning, uh, Sinead Burke, and we have a panel of extraordinary people. Um, and I just want to introduce Sinead for one minute because I've been mulling over what is it about Sinead Burke that is so powerful. And I've been thinking about who does she remind me of, somebody who is fearless and bold. Um, and I've actually been reminded of James Baldwin, as I frequently am, when people are just outstanding, when they are powerful in new ways. And she is that. And part of what we, we, we have used this quote a number of times because it says so much. Not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. Um, and if you are elsewhere in the world and do not know of James Baldwin, he was one of the boldest thinkers in the United States in the 20th century, and absolutely one of the coolest humans to ever come out of the United States. So, um, Sinead, you are an excellent company, and we will now turn it over to you. Gosh, good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, everybody. My name is Sinead Burke. Valerie, thank you so much, firstly, for the warm welcome and the introduction. Never in my life have I been compared to James Baldwin before, and my friends, family, and colleagues will now not be able to work with me at all as I tell them that Valerie has told me I'm like James Baldwin. But and thank you very much. I am such an enormous admirer of the work that you do and think the conversation around human-centered design has been given such momentum due to your work. I also feel very honored to be on such an esteemed panel with many of the people that I admire most. To begin, though, I'd like to give a visual description of myself. I'm a white cisgendered woman who uses the pronouns she and her. I have brown shoulder length hair that is currently still drying from uh, a shower and is at my shoulder, as I shared. I am wearing a long sleeved knitted top by Mazzoni. The color is multicolors of red, blue and green, and it's black and white stripes throughout. I'm here at my home office here just outside of Dublin in Ireland, and I have green and um, floral wallpaper in the background. I'm also wearing bright pink lipstick as I recently saw Barbie, and I'm still living those things. I identify as queer and physically disabled. I am a little person. I want to thank IHTC for the invitation to open this session today. I'm going to begin to share my screen, but just in terms of the other people in terms of other access accommodations. If you would like to have access to captions, we do have human written captions within the session. If you don't know how to access those, they are at the bottom of your screen. So there should be a show captions and a CC icon. If you'd like to click that, there will be live captions on your screen. I won't lie, I'm a little bit nervous. So I'm gonna to try to be mindful of the captioner throughout this session and slow my speech. I'm gonna share screen. In terms of the focus for today's conversation, we're going to be talking about design, fashion through a different lens. There has been such momentum and change as we think about adaptive fashion. Some will say not enough, but there is huge advancements taking place of which many of the people in our panel today will be able to speak to from their own expertise and lived experience. But really, when we think about fashion, disability, moreover, accessibility, I truly believe that there needs to be a holistic ecosystem, not merely sitting to and speaking with product alone, but really thinking about the many touch points that exist for disabled people to meaningfully engage, participate, and be part of the fashion system. But before getting into the notion of designing a more holistic and accessible system, I wanted to tell you a little bit about my journey, who I am, and how I got here. I'm a teacher by training. I decided that I wanted to be a teacher on the day of my fourth birthday. 
I came home and I told my parents that that's what I wanted to do. At the time, my parents didn't say to me that there would be any challenges or difficulties in being a teacher, despite the fact that as a little person, I would rarely be able to reach the light switches, I would rarely be taller than the children, and I would rarely be able to be at the top of the classroom and be seen. They instilled a confidence in me to be ambitious and to encourage me to see that I could do almost anything. The classroom was a microcosm for the world and one of the first examples of the way in which design should be inclusive of everyone. When I began and started to be a teacher, I just redesigned the classroom. The students sat in a U-shape rather than in clusters and groups. They supported me in reaching the light switches and hanging up the artwork on the wall. It was an environment, an ecosystem of co-design and mutual access. But I've been interested in fashion since almost the same time. As a little person, and particularly as a female little person and a queer woman, so much of what I wear demonstrates to the world who I am. And yet being part of these groups and these identities often limited and hindered my access to fashion. I was never designed for. I started a blog, I did a TED talk, and through lots of opportunities got to be a voice within the luxury fashion system, facilitating conversations around disability and design. In 2019, I got to be the first little person on the cover of any Vogue magazine. It was the Forces for Change issue, guest edited by the Duchess of Sussex, Meghan Markle. It was an extraordinary honor to be photographed by Peter Lindbergh, but to also host and hold that first. But I recognize that being the first is not the definition of success in and of itself. It is the product of timing. Generations of people of before me should have held that title. And being the first is one thing, but how do you ensure that you don't be the last? I also got the opportunity to work with Tim Walker at the Business of Fashion and to work with large fashion companies to think about systemic change. But for me, the pandemic was instructive. It was a mass disabling event. For us as individuals, we never had closer proximity to disability than in that time. We were isolated from our loved ones. Our respiratory systems were more challenged. We had to be at home. That is the lived experience for so many disabled people and it continues today. If I look to my closest geographic neighbor in England, in the first wave of the pandemic, six out of 10 people who died of COVID-19 were disabled. And yet the English prime minister, Boris Johnson, never once had a sign language interpreter at any of the press briefings. For me, that transformed how I thought about everything, how I felt about myself. It made me ask the question, did the fashion industry become more accessible because I was part of it, or did it become more accessible to me? And just behind my screen here is a wardrobe of beautiful custom clothes. And I'm very proud of them and very grateful for them. But they are exceptions. They're not available mainstream, and there is yet to be a product offering within the industry at that level to think consciously about including disabled people. So what can one do? For me, I wanted to create a company. I wanted to move from the individual to the collective. I wanted to build an engine that was rooted in education, advocacy, and design to create systemic change first in fashion, and then hopefully in many other industries. We are a consultancy that asks, is this accessible? We are an all disabled team. I work with extraordinary people who live across the map of Europe and we get to work internationally with disabled people designing long-term and short-term solutions to build an accessible and equitable world. It is through this work and this organization that I have truly learned the need for holistic change rather than just focusing on product and output. So in terms of today, in 40 or so minutes, I'm going to bring you through what I think is my theory of change and my thesis. I am open to being disagreed with, challenged, to be completely disbelieved. But this is really rooted in my learnings from the industry itself and how we need and want to think about the future. So I want to talk to you about a baseline understanding of accessibility, people, places, product promotions and some takeaways. In terms of a baseline understanding of disability, I'm mindful that some people are coming to this conversation having been born disabled or acquiring a disability and are very familiar with the lexicon, the history and the understanding. For others, this may be the first time you've ever thought about this work. So for you to know in terms of the current timeline, this is July, it is Disability Pride Month. Yesterday, the Americans with Disabilities Act celebrated 33 years of existence. 
that is the most advanced legislation that we have, and yet still it should be considered the floor and not the ceiling. In a very recent history, we have moved from a model of eugenics to disability and not valuing or feeling that disability was valid at all, to the medical model of disability where disabled people needed to be cured in order to ease closer to a non-disabled existence. We've had a charitable model of disability where governments couldn't provide and didn't provide the services that disabled people needed or required, and instead, nonprofit and charitable organizations were founded and set up. This often led disabled people to be seen as either a burden or always in needing of help rather than individuals with rights and agency. The social model of disability was the understanding that we are often disabled by design, by the built environment, by the attitudes and ableism within society. With the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, which the US has yet to ratify, though we have ratified here in Ireland, the rights of disabled people are underpinned, whether that's the right to education, employment, or dignity. And then the justice model of disability, which is where we are currently striving for, and in some parts of the world embedded. It's acknowledging that disability is not one dimension, it is intersectional. And as we think about disability for too long, there has been a lens of whiteness. There has been a lens of physical disability rather than mental health or mental illness. And really bringing in the thinking of intersectionality, the ways in which identities overlap and ensuring that systems and processes are designed with those who are most marginalized to ensure that nobody is excluded. That's a brief time. But even in thinking about what disability is, our language and understanding and framing of disability must evolve. There was a growing consensus that disability is visible and invisible, that it can be physical, learning, sensory, mental health, mental illness, neurodiversity, disease, or chronic illness. But still what we experience day to day is people sharing, if they have ADHD, for example, that they are not disabled enough, that to self-identify as disabled fills them with shame, that there is still such stigma attached to it, and there's such ableism and harassment as part of society that we really need to unpick. But for example, if you've experienced cancer, that is a disability or an eating disorder or depression. So often we fragment society as us and them, but disability is part of the human life cycle. We will all experience disability at one point in our lives. So much that disability can be congenital, meaning that like me, you were born with your disability. It can be accidental or it can be acquired. But it can also be temporary in that we might leave the office or our homes today and twist our ankle and all of a sudden we are in a boot or in a brace or require surgery. It can be intermittent in that it can be a chronic illness that ebbs and flows, or it can be permanent. I think for too long when we think about designing a world with disabled people in mind, our perspective has been too narrow. For me, when we think about defining disability, I really do think we need a concrete definition because we cannot move from awareness to action until we have familiarity with what it is we are speaking to and who we are speaking about. For me, I like this definition from the World Health Organization, which frames disability about an interaction between individuals and their environment, both in terms of attitudinal, but also the physical built environment. Thinking about the ways in which negative attitudes, inaccessible public transportation, access to public buildings and limited social support creates the friction in which disability exists. And as we shared earlier, I fundamentally believe that one of the talking points that has been left out of this conversation for too long is intersectionality, looking to the research of Kimberly Crenshaw about the ways in which our identities overlap and being mindful that the disabled community is not a monolith, that while you will meet me today who is a little person, you are merely meeting one little person. That if you meet another person with a chondroplasia, their access needs may differ extraordinarily. Their interests definitely will. For me, when we think about disability, one of the things that we need to challenge as a society is the way in which we often talk about disability needing to be something to be overcome. We talk about disabled people often having less skills. But what about if we shifted our mindset, particularly through a lens of design and co-design, and think about the expertise that disabled people embed within all processes and learnings because of their lived experience? I want to show you a brief clip from Elise Roy. So she used to work at Google and is now at Salesforce. In this clip, she talks about, as a young person playing soccer or football, how her deafness made her a better goalkeeper. I'll never forget my coach saying to my mom that 
If she just didn't have her hearing loss, she would be on the national team. But what my coach and what I didn't even know at the time was that my hearing loss actually helped me excel at sports. You see, when you lose your hearing, not only do you adapt your behavior, but you also adapt your physical senses. One example of this is that my visual attention span increased. Imagine a player, a soccer player, coming down the left flank. Imagine being a goalkeeper like I was, and the ball is coming down the left flank. A person with normal hearing would have a visual perspective of this. I had the benefit of a spectrum this wide, so I picked up the players over here that were moving about and coming down the field, and I picked them up quicker. So that if the ball was passed, I could reposition myself and be ready for that shot. Now I must admit that despite watching the World Cup that's taking place down under at the moment, my education and insight into football is still limited. But I think Elise teaches us the importance to reset our perspectives about how we think about disability, ability, and limitations, all of which we each have. And moving further to how fashion as an ecosystem needs to be more inclusive overall, it does start with conversation and language. We need to grow more comfortable and build a consensus around whether or not we're going to be using identity first language, such as disabled person, or person first language, person with a disability. Being mindful that individual disabled people have their own responses and comfort levels with this language, but so often we create synonyms euphemisms in a way in which to distract from using the language of disability because of the discomfort that we have societally. So what we will see is people using differently abled, special needs, all abilities, all their abilities. We even see this in the fashion press as we talk to new announcements, new launches of product design or innovations. We must use the word disability and disabled. And we must also be mindful about how ableism shows up in our language. How often do we talk about things being psycho, crazy, paralyzed, crippled, something being on deaf ears or it being a blind spot. And you may think for a moment, gosh, this is such a lot to think about. This is too much. Why can't we just say what it is we need to say? But I'm mindful of the person who is experiencing mental illness or potentially has a loved one who is accessing or receiving care. If we removed the words mad, crazy, psycho from our language and instead replace them with wild, bananas, or whatever might be appropriate in your own first language. I think about what a generosity that is and what a mindfulness that is to somebody else who may be experiencing all that we don't know. That is a simple act that we can do and can easily put into practice. And lastly, as we think about definitions and language, one of the ways in which we need to move forward is agree a definition and a term of accessibility. In fashion in particular, we talk about things being accessible. And what we usually mean is that it's more affordable, not that it's actually designed with or by disabled people in mind. We talk about accessibility meaning availability. So we at Tilting the Lens have put together a working definition. We believe that accessibility is a continuous and evolving practice and that it is achieved through intentional, meaningful and intersectional representation and participation of people with lived experience of exclusion. We believe it must be key to each stage of a product, place, or policy development from ideation all the way through to delivery and merchandising. That solutions must be designed with disabled people to prioritize form and function. And that the outcomes of accessibility are inclusion, equity, agency, creativity, innovation, and pride. So how does this show up? For me, we're going to talk today widely in the panel around product and the ecosystems. But I want to start with people. When we think about people, places, product and promotions, and starting with people is important because we know that over 1 billion people live with some form of disability. On average, this is about 15% of the population globally. In the US, that is roughly one in four. The UK, it's one in five. But what we know is that stigma around self-identifying as disabled is still looming at large. If we had a better culture, a more equitable society, what would this number be? And when we think about fashion and disability, so often we place disabled people only as consumers. 
only as customers, that their value is in their transaction and their spending power. But it's really important that we acknowledge that disabled people have an employment rate that is 28.8% lower than that of non-disabled people. In most developing countries, the unemployment rate of disabled people is between 50 and 75%. That is due to systemic barriers, access to healthcare, access to supports, access to education, but also an inaccessible employment system and process. And if we do look at disabled people as consumers, what we know in terms of the data is up to 80% of disabled people say that their customer experiences are failures. That is due to a lack of education and training. It's due to digital inaccessibility and physical inaccessibility of retail and office design. So what about if we were to change it? What about if we were to transform our mindset in thinking about disabled people as valuable contributors to the fashion ecosystem? I believe we would first have to start with the recruitment process. There are so many disabled people who already exist within fashion. We do not have data sets in terms of understanding what that representation and percentage is. But even if initially we were to focus on new beginners and new starters, I think we need to begin from the recruitment criteria all the way through to probation and promotion. So what does this look like? In terms of the work that we do, we start with recruitment criteria. How often do you come across a job description? And in the job description, it asks somebody to be a strong communicator. What does that mean in English, in sign language, written, orally? Does that mean that one must be able to maintain eye contact? How often does it ask somebody for a driver's license? Or how often does it assume that the person needs to be in the office and doesn't give any information about whether or not the office has three concrete steps up front, if it has lift access, if it has an opportunity to customize the lighting and the sound for neurodivergent people. And then thinking about the job description and the applicant platform, what we know is that some of the most popular technologies that are used to host job descriptions, be it Workday, be it even Indeed, there is a growing prioritization of accessibility, but still for many people who use screen readers, it is not accessible. In the application review, how many HR and people managers see a spelling mistake and immediately rule somebody out? Do we know if they have dyslexia or not? How many people see a gap in a period of a CV and a resume and rule them out? Not thinking to question whether or not they were on sick leave, whether or not they had a chronic illness and a flare up, whether or not they were caregiving. Even as we think about the interview process, at what point is somebody asked if they need a sign language interpreter or if they would prefer to do it remote? Even thinking about onboarding, often documentation is not captioned. There's no alt text, it's not set up for screen readers. We know that the process in and of itself means that many disabled people rule themselves out from the job description stage and earlier. If we want to truly represent disabled people, and build a fashion ecosystem, it has to start from the very beginning. People invest in people, and disabled people have expert ideas to contribute to this industry. But they need to be not just invited, but the pathway needs to be accessible for them to be able to fully embed and be able to achieve within this line of work. Which brings us to places. So let's say we figured it out. We now know how to equitably and accessibly hire disabled people. And we have an accommodations process that moves beyond reasonability and truly sets people up for success. What does places look like? I think about places as physical and digital. One of the best ways in which I can think about describing the lack of representation of disabled people within the fashion ecosystem is this quote by Simone de Gale. It was never that disabled people did not exist buildings were simply inaccessible. And in many ways, you can remove the word buildings, change it out and say, fashion week, <laughs> runways, venues, events, recruitment scenarios. We have designed a world to be inaccessible. We now need to unpick and redesign. From a retail perspective, we know that 43% of disabled customers abandon in-person shopping due to a lack of accessibility. If I was to think about a mission statement for retail and physical spaces within the fashion system, I fundamentally believe that everyone should be able to enter, use, and leave a building easily, comfortably, and independently, including be able to escape in the event of a fire or other emergency. 
Even in countries where legislation is more advanced, we find that many disabled people, particularly physically disabled people, either can't access a space at all or have to enter from the rear by the bins or can only access it through an emergency elevator and a goods elevator, something that has a completely different experience for those who are, fit, who are those who are non-disabled. Now, for those who are participating in this conversation who are thinking, yes, but it is expensive. Yes, but it is costly. Yes, there is legislation that are barriers. Some of those are real challenges. But the reality is, is that if we prioritize accessibility into our physical spaces in particular from the very beginning of a plan, it is less costly. The challenge comes about when there isn't a prioritization of this work and there isn't disabled people in the room to argue for its importance. We know that for new buildings, it increases the budget by only zero to 0.4%. And even for renovations, this increase is about one to 1.2%. In Europe in particular, there was legislation around historic and protected buildings. But what we need are more innovative design solutions because how long are we going to continue to exclude disabled people in the name of architecture? Some of the work that we do is about leveraging the lived experience of disabled people. It's about doing in-store reviews with people with physical disabilities, sensory disabilities, and learning disabilities, gaining their insights and expertise over a period of time to create better design policies that move from compliance to community and creativity. Often the design elements that we look to are access, signage and wayfinding, queuing, ordering, payment, collection, water closets and bathrooms, furniture and fixtures, in-store experience, and digital experience. We want environments that are frictionless for people to be able to have an equitable experience. And even thinking about the opportunity for innovation and creativity and design that exists, if we begin to think about colors and colorblindness, which affects huge numbers of the population, particularly when we look to gender dynamics, if we begin to think about the way in which we could create more beautiful environments that are mindful for everybody's access needs, there are real opportunities at play. And as we think about colour and neurodiversity, the Living Autism Initiative talks about soft, mild colours as being friendly web design, but also making sure that that takes place in the built environment. But even as we think about the design of our physical space and our retail, there's so much more to do. To share with you some case studies that are moving forward in this field, Starbucks is really paving the way for more inclusive and accessible experiences, particularly in the US looking to create an elevated standard of accessibility by 2030. We need to ask though, how is this not just focused on customers? How is this also focused on employees? But thinking about the ways in which we can engage in these places in more immediate ways is truly exciting. And thinking about a recent announcement with Gucci, and to hold my hands up, we had a part to play in this. Thinking about the ways in which digital solutions can build accessibility in the long and in the short term. We supported Gucci to partner with Ira, which is a San Diego-based Diego assistive technology company for people who are blind and low vision. We had the fortune to announce this with Vogue Business by doing a partnership with a woman called Ginny, who's an amazing singer-songwriter. How the app works is that the individual downloads the app within the store. They are connected with a real-life visual interpreter. That interpreter has permissions to access the back camera of their phone and can guide them through the store. I'm going to play a small piece of this video, but if anyone would like access to the article and the video in full, please do email me afterwards and let me know. In the Gucci meatpacking store, two women wears a cream silk blouse and black that supports people who are blind and low vision accessing places and spaces that were once inaccessible. Why is it important that Ira is in a place like this? Ginny is white and has a brown bob with a fringe. She wears a navy and white striped jumpsuit under a denim jacket, complete with gold earrings and necklaces. Moving along shelves displaying shoes, Ginny holds a cane with one hand and her smartphone with the other. So here on the right in front of you are loafers. Wonderful. The key reason it's important is because it provides an opportunity for people who cannot see or who are visually impaired, a visual understanding of the store and what's in front of them. Gucci and Ira logos appear center screen. This is about progress, not perfection. There's so much work to do, but if we can merge physical and digital together, there's real opportunity to create more equitable. In the As we think loosely about product, and I won't dwell on physical product too much because we're going to be speaking to that in the panel discussion, but I think 
the focus on product as the only output for accessibility and for representation and the meaningful inclusion of disabled people is a question we must continuously interrogate within the fashion system. From a digital product perspective, we know that companies with inaccessible websites and digital strategies are losing 6.9 billion per annum to competitors. Globally, if we think about the EU specifically, the new Digital Accessibility Act that is coming down the tracks will affect companies in 2024, 2025 to really ensure that legislation and compliance is a minimum standard. If we think about blind internet users, they abandon two transactions per month because of digital inaccessibility. And we know that there's $10 billion in design spending set to shift to companies that prioritize accessibility. But we need to rethink our mindset about product overall. For too long, when we think about designing for disabled people, we've taken a medicalized approach. It is a silver metal clunky ramp that is awkward, potentially unsafe, and doesn't provide agency for the disabled person. Instead of thinking about the image on the right, which is the Guggenheim Museum, when the architect created equitable access and experience for as many people as possible by designing it as a ramp. Whether you are a little person, a wheelchair user, somebody using a mobility aid, a parent with a stroller, this is a space that is designed to be thinking about the multiple experiences that the user might have. And as we think about product, and as we think about fashion and disability and product, one of the questions we need to be asking for and advocating is about co-design. How are we not continuously iterating the cycles of exclusion and oppression of disabled people as we create better products? We need to be ensuring that disabled people are valued for their expertise and lived experience, economically and with power and responsibility. We must share power. We must prioritize relationships. We must use participatory means and we must build capacity and disabled people must have agency and autonomy within these innovations. Some work that's being undertaken is by designing adaptive tools that make currently inaccessible items much more accessible. We have Nike designing the fly ease in terms of being able to get into shoes without any need to be able to use grip or focus. We know that Skims, Liberare, and many other brands are creating adaptive focus products, which truly are about building inclusivity and access for all. What we know from a technology side is whether it is Clinique or Snap, we are having marginally better representation of disabled people. And from a digital perspective, we recently see Estee Lauder and see Lancome creating assistive tools, be it to support people putting on lipstick independently with a separate device, or secondly, using digital technologies and AI functions to support innovation. In terms of a case study within the space, one of the things that we got to work on was supporting Gucci.com to become the most accessible version of the website thus far. So thinking about alt text, thinking about screen reader legibility and thinking about color contrast and the opportunity for people to play on and off sound depending on their sensory requirements. But thinking about promotion, there is often this phrase that if one can see it, one can be it. I shared at the beginning of this presentation that some of the chapters and the starting points in my journey was about being the first little person on the cover of Vogue. I was very proud to do that and to hold that qualification. But as I left the set that day, I made a quiet promise and commitment to myself that if I could ever do anything or ever be in a position wherein we could create more radical change for disabled people and further invite more and more people in, that I would consider that an honor but an obligation. In March 2023 of this year, Tilting the Lens partnered with British Vogue to create reframing fashion, Vogue's most accessible issue yet, and the one that is most representative thus far of disabled people. As part of the issue, we created five covers. On the left, we have Justine Miles. In the middle, it's Ellie Goldstein. And in the right, it's Aaron Rose Phillip, who we'll hear from later on. And then it's me and Selma Blair. It was really important that when we were asked to be partners and consulting editors with British Vogue in this issue, that we removed any tropes or misconceptions of disability. We ensured that the idea of having more disabled people in fashion magazines as a concept was put in place as a reality. One of the things that we had to think about was having disabled people in the magazine is one thing, but how do we ensure that the set was accessible and it was a seamless experience? We began by reviewing and auditing every studio in London where the shoots took place. 
We ask questions such as what and where is the nearest step-free public transportation link? Are there accessible and gender neutral bathrooms on all levels? Is there step-free access from street to set? Is the backstage hair and makeup area accessible with maneuvering space for wheelchair users? We only had two studios to choose from, but it was important to us that not only do we make these prioritizations, but it's something that becomes part of British Vogue's practice forevermore. I truly believe that this allowed us to have the greatest representation of disabled people in the room. It allowed them to bring their whole selves to the shoot and also ensured that we could not just have disabled people in front of the camera, but a part of the crew, a part of the office works, and that everybody had as much agency as they could and was required on the day. Other parts of the progress that we are very proud of is introducing audio description for the first time. I'm going to play a piece of video for you that is from the Vogue shoot. Someone uses a clapperboard before a mottled gold studio backdrop. Clips are shown of stylishly dressed people of different races, ages and disabilities sitting on the studio chair. Interview start. I'm Selma Blair. I am wearing a T-length black long sleeve fitted dress. My hair is bleach blonde with some dark roots and I'm wearing black suede heels with red nylon panels on the side. And I am using in my right hand a black lacquered cane with a silver handle. I'm just Tina Miles. I have a blonde afro. I'm wearing a brown, white, and black striped dress with brown pointy shoes. I am Rose Jones. I have long, wavy, gray hair. I am wearing an orange power jacket, a suit, trousers, and I am in a studio with a gold background. My name is Sinead. I'm going to pause there because you've already heard enough from me. But if you would like to access the rest of that video, I will share that link afterwards. So creating greater representation of disabled people in Vogue was important front and behind the camera. Ensuring that the infrastructure was accessible was vital. We know that a definition of accessibility is about making things available in more than one format, multiple format, multiple modes of connectivity. It was important for us that we challenged how Vogue was accessed and for the first time created a Braille edition of Vogue, both physical and digital Braille. We partnered with the Royal National Institute of the Blind and ensured that not just the content, but that all of the advertisements were made available in Braille too. British Vogue have made the commitment to make every issue available in physical and digital Braille for the next 12 months and have set up a specific line of communication, accessibility at vogue.co.uk if people would like to access those materials. This is not perfection, but it is about moving the dial, even just slightly. So to leave you with some takeaways, being mindful that it is Disability Pride Month and that it's not so recent since we lost Judy Human, I wanted to share this quote with you. Part of the problem is that we tend to think that equality is about treating everyone the same when it's not. It's about fairness. It's about equity of access. If we think about a fashion system, how do we design with and for disabled people to create equity of access? that will not just benefit the disabled community, but will benefit us all. I ask you to create with disabled people, not for disabled people. I share with you that a budget is a moral document and that what we prioritize financially often reflects in our strategic priorities and in the outcomes that we value. I believe that innovative, accessible design can and should be functional and beautiful, and that our attempts at inclusion should not be othering by design. And that lastly, the disability community is not a monolith. There is so much to do, but if this only ever becomes the responsibility and obligation of disabled people, change will take too long. When we think about fashion, it cannot just be product. It needs to be an ecosystem that is changed by us, with us, and for us. Thank you very much. I will hand back to Boston.
or if anybody has questions, please now put them in the chat. But I think we're going to go to the panel next. Uh, we are going to the panel next. Thank you so much, Meg. Um, really terrific. Um, I love the framing, love the buildup of your points. Um, really terrific. I'm sorry. Um, do we have a so I, I am also embarrassed that um, we forgot to describe ourselves up front. Um, so I am going to take the lead and do that uh, in my embarrassed state. So I am Valerie Fletcher. I am a white woman with an Auburn page boy and what was described as fringe bangs in the US. Um, I am an older woman. I'm wearing a black blouse, silk blouse, and white pants. Um, I'll leave it at that and turn to my colleague, Jess Mendez, to describe herself. Good afternoon from the East Coast, everyone. Um, my name is Jess Mendez. I'm the Director of Communication and Inclusive Impact here at IHCD. Um, I am a cisgendered black woman with tan skin and green eyes. I have a pixie cut with bleach blonde hair and dark roots. I'm wearing a sheer uh, burnt orange graphic top and a satin skirt. I'm sitting in the IETD office alongside Valerie and one of our panelists, Jay. Um, my name is Jay Cauldron. I am a, a queer Puerto Rican man. man. Um, I am uh, short, dark hair, I'm wearing uh, tortoise glasses, uh, have a, a full beard and mustache, a red shirt and jeans, and uh, very happy to be here. <laughs> so we are, we are delighted that we have one of our panelists who is with us. So Jay is one of our panelists. Um, and uh, we are going to give each panelist an opportunity to uh, introduce why inclusive fashion matters to them. Um, but before we begin with the panelists, I actually want to give Jess an opportunity because Jess Mendez um, joined us last summer in her role with us. And she has been talking about inclusive fashion from before the day she started work. Um, this has been a passion of Jess's. We have talked about it um, for a very long time. Um, and I want her to talk about why this is such a passion for her. So Jess, would you begin? Of course. <laughs> We're sharing a mic. Can everyone hear me now? Okay, perfect. Um, this panel is very special to me. It's been over a year in talking to Valerie about it. So again, I want to thank all of our speakers, Shanae, our panelists, and all of the attendees. Um, inclusive fashion is very special to me for two reasons. I am the oldest sibling of three. My youngest brother has cerebral palsy, developmental um, global delay, um, epilepsy, and a series of other physical and intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, my family migrated here from Cape Verde, West Coast Africa, and my entire life, my mom has great style and she has passed that on to all of us but I think specific to my youngest brother she always emphasized the importance of him being dressed well um, when we took him to doctor's appointments or physical therapy or even sending him to school um, because his appearance um, she never wanted him to appear as if he was neglected um, and fashion was a big part of that and as his body changed being a full-time wheelchair user um, we've had challenges with finding clothes that fits him um, but I'm grateful that my family's creative problem solving has also given him the opportunity to have his own style um, outside of my relationship with my brother in fashion personally um, I'm a producer and strategist, and I've worked on a handful of commercial uh, pro like campaigns. Um, and it's really important to understand how I can take my learnings from IHCD and pass it on to other production sets. Um, but also, I am grateful to have an, 
a beautiful circle of designers and creatives around me and also just sharing that knowledge with them um, is is special and I think worth sharing so again thank you all for being here um, I've I feel very honored that this conversation is happening today Thank you, Jess. And I think because we have, we're, we're lucky to have one of our panelists in the room with us here in Boston, um, we are going to turn to my, my longtime friend, Jay Calderon, who um, created Boston Fashion Week 29 years ago. And this year he's doing something quite special. So talk to us about why this matters to you, Jay, and begin this storytelling by the panelists, please. Uh, well, Fashion Week here in Boston was always different. Uh, we designed it to be a civic initiative, something that was designed to provide access, you know, to, to more initially to the, from the community to the design community. And then over the years, we've explored that in all different ways. And last year in particular, we were doing um, AR installations, augmented reality throughout the city, so that everyone had access to uh, elements of, of Fashion Week. And we explored uh, something based on something that you had said to me, is you know um, who's missing, like who's not in the picture, who's not being uh, seen, and uh, and that that just kind of was kept resonating in my head, and uh, we started to do that last year, and then this year that's just developing e even further. So the idea of thinking of uh, I'm I'm also a teacher, so that kind of. I always seem to have my teacher hat on, and in, when you teach in fashion, there are a lot of standardized things. Like you know, when we design a figure, it's quote unquote the ideal figure, and that's something that I've been trying to you know get students to to move away from and to not think of one version. And the same thing with Fashion Week, we it, it we we find different ways to to make it accessible. One of those things is, for instance, Glam Slam. And Glam Slam is a storytelling event and it allows people in the industry to talk about meaningful moments. And you know, we've heard all these incredible stories and we get to know the people, right? So, um, but then uh, again, on the teaching side, for me, the, the really important part is having students think about it not necessarily being a specialty, like something that they do separate from their design process, but it being a natural thing for them to include in their design process as they create, because a lot of those young people are gonna be showing during Fashion Week you know, in, in the future. So it's kind of this big circle of, of making it accessible, making it real, making it human. Thank you, Jane. Thank you for all you do. Uh, you are you are an, a phenomenal asset to any young designer in Boston. You managed to be uh, a mentor to more people than I can imagine on a on an annual basis, and he's been doing it for decades. Um, I think as we as we move towards the panel, um, we have a panelist who I'm going to put on next because he is joining us at an ungodly hour of the day because he's joining us from Tokyo. And that is to Tepe Maeda. And I want to just acknowledge up front that he has created a new company doing something that is quite unusual. Um, and he uh, began that company after a career in one of the most popular fashion uh, businesses in the world. Um, and he's going to tell us that story. Um, and he is also the winner with this big idea of the International Association for Universal Designs, one of the gold award winners for uh, his, the, 19, the 2022 um, program. So, uh, and I want to acknowledge that we have Rosako Nozaki, who is one of our team, totally bilingual, who is going to be vocalizing for Mr. Maeda. Hi. えっと、あ、まずバレリーさん、今日はあの、この間に呼んでいただいてありがとうございます。えっと、東京か、
今日は来ていますであの背景はあの白い部屋の背景を使っていますよろしくお願いします Thank you, Valerie, for the warm introduction. Hi, everyone. My name is Teppe Maeda. I'm joining today from Tokyo. I founded a company called Kiasku, which works as an online clothing alteration service targeted for people with disabilities or illness. Today, I'm wearing a white shirt with short black hair with a background of a, of a white room. Why you created this company、um, and about the impact of that company to date? Hmm. Ah, I got it. Eh, to, I got it. 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 あの、働いてたんですけれども、で、あの、働いてるときに、まあ、障害、病気のある方のですね、洋服の悩みをたくさん聞く機会がありまして、で、その中で、あの、障害、病気のある方は、あの、好きな洋服を選ぶというよりも、あの、着やすい服を、やっぱりどうしても選ばないといけないっていう、あのことに悩まれたくさんの方が悩んでいらっしゃるのをあの目の当たりにしましてそれを何かあの解決したいなと思って、えっと、ユニクロを辞めて、えっと、自分で会社を作ってであのキヤスクというサービスを、えっと、作りましたであの、えっと、キヤスクはですね、えっと、あの着やすさ、着やすい服をあの選ぶんではなくて、先に自分が着たい服を選んで、で後から一人一人の、えっと、体、障害や病気のある方の体の状態に合わせて、後から、あの、それに合わせてお直しをするというサービスなんですけども、そうすることで、あの、まあ、誰もが、あの、着やすい服ではなくて、えっと、着たい服を着られるようになるんじゃないかと。思って、えっと、サービスを、えっと、去年の3月からですね、えっと、始めましたであの。特徴は、サービスの特徴3つあると思っていて、えっと、1つは、その障害や病気のある人の、えっと、ニーズに特化したあのお直しメニューを用意していること。で2つ目が、えっと、体の不自由な方、移動が大変な方でも、えっと、全部自宅で、えっと、サービスを完結できるように、オンラインでサービスを展開していること。で、三つ目が、えっと、お直しの対応をするスタッフが、の多くがですね、あの、えっと、障害のあるお子さんを持つお母さん。まあ、そういった方がですね、きちんとその、お客様のニーズをちゃんと具体的にイメージできる。まあ、そういう方が、あの、対応しますので、えっと、まあ、その障害や病気のある人の、えっと、悩みにちゃんと寄り添って、えっと、お直しを対応できるというのがあの特徴かなというふうに思います。まあ、なのであの安心してあのお直しの注文をいただけるようにあの気をつけて、えっと、運営をしています。以上です。I'm sure a lot of you are familiar. There's a lot of stores in the US, but I used to work at Uniqlo. And when I was working at Uniqlo, I had the opportunity of interacting with people with disabilities and was able to hear stories from them. And one of the things that was really surprising to me was that a lot of people can't choose their own clothes that they wear based off of preference. It's not a, cho it's not a choice of, well, let's go with my style. Does this fit well with me? But they had to choose clothes based on comfort and wearability. Hearing that, I wanted to change that. And Left、um, Uniqlo and founded Kiasku last March.、Um, and so at Kiasku, we work for people to be able to choose their clothing based on preference and personal style, what they want to wear, and not just about whether they can actually just wear it or not. And to increase their choice and opportunities and、um, just their fashion expression as well. 
Some things that are special for Kiasku is that we offer specific to individual needs. And so it is a um, custom process for each person. It is fully online. So even if someone isn't able to leave their house or go to a specific location, um, every, because everything is online, um, it increases more people to be able to use our service. And also all of our staff um, at Kiasku are mothers of children with disabilities. So they serve as caretakers as well. And so they have their own personal experience and so have that extra lens of being able to understand what it means to wear clothing with a disability or put clothing on to someone with a disability and to have that extra layer of understanding. So that's what really makes Kiasku special and such a holistic experience to our customers. Thank you. Thank you. That That is a, a wonderful story. I, I know some of our um, audience are actually, uh, there's a mother who has, has sent a note uh, about the frustration of trying to find clothing for her son, and he is stuck in sweatpants everywhere he goes. So um, I think there's definitely an audience in the U.S. We should explore whether it's feasible for people to uh, imagine replicating what you're doing in more countries around the world. I want to invite um, our next uh, panelist to um, take a minute and talk about um, their own sense of why inclusive fashion matters. And I'm going to go to Aaron Rose Phillips, who is um, a first in the world uh, in terms of uh, her identity Thanks. as a professional model, a uh, person with a disability using a wheelchair, uh, Black, trans, uh, and delightful. So Aaron, please tell us your story about why inclusive fashion matters. Valerie, I want to thank you so much for your wonderful introduction to me. Thank you so much. I appreciate it so, so, so much. Um, hello, everyone. I hope you're having a beautiful day. My name is Aaron Rose Phillip. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I'm going to start out with introducing myself by a visual, descript um, a visual um, description of myself. Um, I'm sorry for the, the, the very brief delay in my um, speaking and talking and appearance, but I am here. And I'm so happy to be with you all. Thank you for having me today. Um, I am a Black, physically, physically disabled, transgender woman. Um, I am wearing today a Black bob with a fringe and curly hair. Um, I'm wearing minimal lip gloss and minimal accessories, such as my Keith Haring X Pandora ring and my, and my blue silver and white um, bracelet. I am wearing a Lon Ron button-down shirt that's white with minimal stripes and Black skinny jeans, and um, I'm so happy to be with you all today. I feel so lucky and honored to be here. So I just want to thank you so much for including me today amongst such a beautiful lineup of people and visionaries and thinkers and people who have contributed so much to, to disabled society and contemporary um, understanding of disability in our culture. Um, I want to start off with saying that um, disability in fashion is something that honestly has ruled my whole life. Um, I started my modeling career at 16 and 17 years old, respectively. And um, inclusive fashion means a lot to me because as a young trans child who was, who was physically disabled, I always had read all the fashion magazines. I had Elle, Dave, Vogue, um, Re-Edition, um, all these magazines, like I can't even lift because honestly, I have so much in my room. I'm in my bedroom, by the way, and I have all these magazines in front of me. Um, I, I wish I could show you, but I'm not gonna even do that. But um, um, I always had a passion and love for fashion. And because um, I was so enamored by this world of glamor and glitz and the fact that fashion is something that unites people in a sense of pop culture and a sense of physical identity, mental identity, and um, I loved it so much. I loved fashion so much, but I realized that um, as much as I loved fashion so much, I never actually saw myself in these magazines that I used to read. Such as, you know, I used to look through the pages and I would only ever see um, honestly predominantly white, physically um, able-bodied, cisgender, like six foot people modeling beautiful clothing. And as much as I loved it, I couldn't help but wonder 
you know, you walk outside your own door every day and you see people of all different creeds, races, identities, and physical abilities, disabled or not, existing in the world and consuming and understanding and loving and wearing clothes and fashion. So I kind of had this point where I was like, is it that the fashion industry feels as if only certain people can enjoy luxury clothing? Are they saying that disabled people like myself can't ever have access to this? This is not a part of my world. It's not a part of something that I can enjoy. As if, you know, someone like myself cannot wear clothes or identify with clothing. And that was kind of the thesis and the entire starting point of why I wanted to get into modeling in the first place. But when I think about why inclusive fashion is important to me, inclusive fashion is so important to me because I really, 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 really wanted to see myself in a place where I was not ever really seen or represented on the runway and editorial pages and beauty campaigns on billboards. Um, and to this day, honestly, I am still advocating for um, that kind of representation. But we made so much incredible steps, such as the cover of British Vogue that Sinead Burke and Tilting the Lens helped to make happen and come true, which is honestly one of the most amazing and um, heartfelt and special opportunities I've ever had in my life to share space with Sinead, but also to have something like that really exist in my world, um, you know, that made my dream come true in a, in a really big way. And um, I still have a lot to look forward to and a lot to work towards in terms of my modeling career, but I feel that much more so because of the fact that um, I have been able to be the first of a lot of things in high fashion as a model and as an um, advocate, but I never wanted to be the only one doing what I do in the fashion industry as a model. I've always wanted the door to open for other talent like myself who are physically disabled or who have disabilities of any kind to really be platformed and understood and be able to work not only for ourselves but alongside our able-bodied peers doing all the things that we do. So um, inclusive fashion is so important to me because I feel as if people with disabilities and disabled people should be understood that we consume, wear, and love clothing and luxury fashion like, anyone, like anybody else does. Aaron, thank you. Thank you. We, thank you we so look much, forward Valerie. to thank being you. fans of your long career. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And we have Rebecca Tosik, who is um, Dr. Rebecca Tosik, who is joining us from Kansas City. Um, Rebecca is somebody that I think many of us have first encountered by a growing reputation as a person who is articulating issues that we need to talk about. And I, I want to, we, we've been neglectful of all of the important work that our panelists have done, including Sinead, in terms of their role as authors. And I want to give a shout out to Rebecca, because Rebecca wrote a very popular book called Sitting Pretty. And if you haven't read it, do read it. Um, Sitting yeah. Pretty will give you entree to her deepest thoughts. This is a woman who has cracked the code for giving people a sense of real intimate storytelling. It's just terrific. And I thought that the whole idea of Sitting Pretty, and she shares pictures of herself and her family um, online. And I, I just feel a level of connection born of the invitation that she created. So she had to be part of this. So please tell us, Sitting pretty, and where does all of this align with your extraordinary life? Rebecca. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, wow. Um, before I dive in, my, my head is spinning with all of these ideas. Um, before I dive in, I'll just do a quick description um, of what is on my screen here. So uh, yeah, I'm Rebecca Tasaga. I'm a cisgender white woman with uh, a bob, blondish bob, very short bangs. Um, and I'm wearing um, a, a knitted white top um, with some very pale pastel colors woven in there. And uh, I'm in a rather busy room. Um, I have some plants coming off the wall and plants um, on a piano behind me and a bunch of books there in the background. And there is a really big smile on my face because I am thrilled and humbled and a little bit nervous to be in this amazing company 
um, to be with this group of people. Um, and also really um, humbled and honored Valeria, you are talking about my book and, and the value of it and the stories of it. So um, yeah, I mean, I think to dive into my intersection in this conversation, I am a storyteller. Uh, I see everything through the lens of storytelling. And I think at the heart of this conversation and, and a lot of what I was trying to get at uh, in my book is um, the way that we build the world, the way we design the world tells a story about who we believe belongs here. Um, and I think fashion is such a vital part of the story that we're telling about who belongs here. So I, um, you can't actually see it in the screen. I'm always cut off my second, my bottom half is cut off, but I have a, a wheelchair down here. I'm a wheelchair user. Um, I grew up as a wheelchair user. My first wheelchair was uh, hot pink and I covered it in really tacky smiley face stickers um, immediately, right? Asserting the, the beauty and the function of that tool, right? Um, <clears throat> but like Aaron Rose, I grew up saturated in fashion magazines and I had all of them too. I had Cosmopolitan and Elle and, and Vogue and Allure and um, all the catalogs that I would pour over. I had these Delia's catalogs that would come in the mail. And <clears throat> I probably looked at each one like 600 times before the next one came out. And I would cut out these pictures and um, I tuck them into my mirror and tape them on my closet door. And, um, and the thing that was maybe glaringly obvious um, was that none of them looked like me. Um, I, I looked out into the world, um, the world at large, the world of fashion, the world in magazines, um, and I didn't see myself in that story. Um, and, and part of that was clothing design, right? Like part of it is like, all of these clothes are designed for people walking and standing, which I do not do, um, um, with very specific body shapes. But it, it was also um, kind of to touch on what Sinead was saying about all these touch points. Um, it was also what happened when I showed up to buy clothes, to go to a shop. Can I get into that shop? Um, can I even reach the clothing on the hangers, right? Like half of the clothes, I guess I just won't look at because I can't pull them off of the hangers. Or um, is there a space for me to try on these clothes? And um, if there happens to be a space, is it is it free for me to use or is it full of like storage, um, <laughs> used as a storage space? Um, so so I, I looked around in this world and, and I, I think one of the main things that I took away from that um, was that I, I didn't actually belong. And I love hearing um, Aaron Rose, you talking about um, how you saw that and you thought, why is this? And maybe I can be a part of that. I love that picture, that story, because um, that is not what, how I responded. And I am so glad that you did for your benefit, but for the whole world's benefit, right? Um, I think for me, what I took away at that age, like a young teen looking toward adulthood and trying to imagine myself into adulthood, um, what I took away was that I didn't actually belong um, and that none of this, and I'm, I'm gesturing my hands around the room like this world wasn't really for me. Um, and there's a lot of tragedy in that belief, right? Um, because I, I think that I wasn't the only one receiving the world that way. I've not been the only one to look around and say, um, it doesn't look like I belong here. I think so many of us for a long time have, have looked out into the world and the world uh, of fashion and, and not seen ourselves reflected in that space. Um, and, and I think a lot of us, thankfully not all of us, but a lot of us haven't internalized that belief um, about belonging. And I think it, it's hard to articulate or calculate the impact and the harm of that kind of belief on a person um, and, a, and a group of people. Uh, and so maybe I would, um, if there's anything to kind of offer as hopeful or exciting is just how much potential there is in the world of fashion to get at the heart of that story about who belongs and, and who we are as humans. Um, I think fashion is so much about that. We've, we've talked a little bit about like um, the clothes that we put on our bodies and the clothes that we can have access to put on our bodies um, are such a powerful tool for exerting who we are and how we want to be seen in the world, especially um, when you live in a body that is often 
um, assumed you know, that there are all these assumptions about what that life must be or what that person who that person must be it's so important to have the tool of fashion to exert for ourselves right like the stickers on my hot pink wheelchair right like um wanting to exert who i am to the world and i think fashion is such a powerful place to do that um and as Sinead walked us through looking at all of these ways that we can do this work of including more and and telling a story um where all of us belong, there's so many things that we can do um, and and um, to tell a more inclusive story, to build a more inclusive world. Um, and to me, it's inc more inclusive, but it's also more interesting and more beautiful and more liberating. Um, it's all of those things. So um, yeah, I guess I don't want to ramble the day away. I'm so excited to be here. Um, this conversation <laughs> is so important and valuable and I, um, uh, I, I'm excited to dig in more uh, with the whole group. So, thank you, Rebecca, um, so much. Let me let me also. I was reminded when you were talking um, of of Judy Human, who who Sinead mentioned earlier, and Judy was somebody who cared greatly about fashion. She, Judy never showed up without being fully made up. She never showed up without her nails being done. She never showed up without her favorite cool clothes. Not ever. Um, we had an ongoing quest to get a good designer to design shoes that Judy could wear. And I am sorry to say we never pulled it off, but it was all in, in, honor, in honor of her clear communication that this is who I am and these things matter. These are not small issues. So uh, uh, just a, a, a nod to our wonderful leader. Uh, it's time to invite people who are joining us um, out there in the world um, to be part of this conversation. And this is a conversation. We will probably, they'll probably be clear that some of uh, the questions are targeted to particular people, but I am going to defer to Jess now who will field questions from our audience. Yes. The first question is from Nat Hosano. Um, in Japan. Could you, this is for Shanae, could you explain a bit more about Gucci, the example for blind a blind person to recognize color of shoes, because this must be useful for blind people um, using toilets, because I'm a member of the Japanese Toilet Association. Hi, Nat. Very nice to meet you. I cannot think of a better job than being a member of the Japanese Toilet Association. I'm not sure if there's one that's local to me, but sign me up because I think, and I'm not at all being glib, I think often bathrooms are this environment where dignity is always at play. And even when accessible bathrooms exist, they are designed by non-disabled people for disabled people. They are often designed to compliance only rather than to create that sense of belonging that Rebecca was talking about and creating that sense of safety and pride. I can't tell you how often I have lipstick on my teeth or uneven lipstick because I cannot reach or see in the mirrors, even in accessible bathrooms. So I think your question is, is really important. So to share with you how the technology works, exactly as you described, it would be useful in similar and all environments of that nature. So IRA is a assistive technology that supports with a human connection. There are similar other technologies like Be My Eyes, which relies on volunteerism. So if you are a sighted person, you can sign up to be a support system for blind and low vision people through Be My Eyes, where you take calls and you direct people. I think it's an amazing service. I think one of the things that's really great about Ira, for example, is that the visual interpreters who log on are trained and have expertise and can give people who are blind and low vision the specific information that they need. So to your point around to toilets, let's say I was in a shopping center or a mall and I needed or wanted to access a toilet. IRA can happen in two ways. It can either be a partnership with that mall. Let's say it's Westfield and Westfield says we're going to use IRA in all of our malls. If you're a person who's blind and low vision to use that app, you won't pay because Westfield has a partnership with IRA and they will also have a floor plan. So when you log into IRA, you are connected with a real life person. You say to that person, hey, I want to go to the closest accessible bathroom or I want to go to the bathroom. Where do I go? That person will be able to see at the back camera of the phone and will also have a floor plan. 
However, if you are a person who's blind and low vision and you just want to log on to the app, you can. You charge minutes and you can put money into your IRA account and you'll be able to access that support. And the same thing, that individual will be able to guide you to the bathroom. They'll be able to look to the signage and they'll be able to support you in that environment. We did a project a couple of years ago with the Irish Architecture Association. Every year they have this annual festival called Open House, where one night you get access to some of the most beautiful buildings in the world that had never really been targeted or accessible to people who are blind and low vision. But we put IRA across every single building that night. And for the first time, people who are blind and low vision were able to access those spaces independently and with agency by using that software. So it can be used in multiple ways, not just at Gucci, not just in retail, but to be able to support the built environment becoming more accessible. If you would like a connection to IRA, please do email me. I'll put my email address in the chat and I can join the dots and support that. If I might just interject, um, IRA has been used fairly extensively in the United States for public transit. Um, and the transit authorities will, as more often than not, will actually pay so that people don't actually have to spend their own money to access it. That's a great check. You can also use it, I think, in every Starbucks in the US. If you need caffeine. Um, next question is from Rachel Cobb. I'd love to know more about the production team behind projects like that British Vogue issue. How can we do a better job of making sure that disabled people are centrally involved in all aspects of photography, writing, staffing, setup, production, publication? Also really appreciate your comments about seeing setting expectations for accessible places and working conditions for the entirety of these projects. I think this is a great question. So how we did it was a number of different ways. And my apologies for the light. I mean, I cannot believe that I'm in Ireland and apologizing for the sun, but it is 6.30 p.m. here and I have a south facing garden. So you're catching me at just the time in which there's a light. So my apologies if it's difficult to see me. In terms of this specific project and production, we did a number of key things. The overall agency that was signed as a production partner was deliberately chosen because there was representation within that organization and within their network of people who had visible and invisible disabilities. But to also ensure, because what we know and specifically what you're speaking to around photography, writing, staffing, some of the biggest challenge for disabled people to access these careers is that one, they're often required to work for free which they often cannot afford to do, and they don't have the information on whether the environment is accessible. Two, it's often about who you know, not what you know. And three, it often means that you have to live in London, which has higher rates, it's more expensive. So in order to try to ensure that we had people who had all of the expertise and that this was their first role, we worked with an organization called Deaf and Disabled People in TV, and we put together a number of roles for both in terms of first job and very experienced people and was very clear on what was required of them in terms of actual skill set, in terms of qualification, in terms of time, whether or not there would be rest breaks and periods, also in terms of fees and what was and wasn't available and what they could kind of argue for, and then thinking about what that mentoring would be required if this was their first role. It wasn't perfect. We should have had and could have had more disabled people on set, but what we did as an afterwards is everybody who we engage with, those who are on set and those who for many reasons weren't able to participate, we created a database and we handed that to British Vogue and said, hey, now you have a beginning roster of disabled talent. Let's continue to build it and evolve it because there are more photographers, there are more writers. And every time we come across somebody in our network, we add them to the Tilting the Lens database and we send them to Vogue and go, hey, have you heard of these people? We did the exact same thing with writers and ensuring that every story in the magazine was written by a disabled writer and that there was a whole list of content online that was written by disabled writers too. Thank you for that. Um, my next question is specific to Mighty san um, I want to give you your flowers. Um, for addressing a need in the market, but also creating an economy for caregivers. It's often, um, I've learned from personal experience, it can be very stressful and, and wearing. Um, so seeing that full circle moment is so important and special. 
Um, and it's obvious that it's a business model that was built with its intention and attention to detail. Um, so again, our heartfelt gratitude. Um, and I'm curious, with your experience at working at a larger company like Uniqlo, how do you see this business model scaling or being an example for other businesses that are looking to be more inclusive? So it's there. あの、えっと、あ、すいません。企業、企業にもあの、やっぱり今企業もあのま、いろいろあの誰誰一人取り残さないっていうあのことをあの掲げていろんなその企業活動をやってる企業たくさんいますのであのま、例えばですけどもあのえっと、コスチュームを着て職業体験、子供、子供側の職業体験をするっていうテーマパークを応援している企業があるんですね。で、そういう企業だとやっぱりあの今のコスチュームだとえっと障害のあるお子さんとかってやっぱり着られないんですよね。でもそれってやっぱ
our service as a whole. And I believe that putting that as a core belief is um, what's going to push us and drive us to drive and um, to grow our business as well. Thank you. Thank you. One of the things that is perfectly clear today is that we've got to go upstream to change how people think about these things. And I think um, one of the one of our panelists actually brings decades of experience of training young people who are passionate about design. And I and I think it, it's one of the big challenges. Everybody knows today that there is a level of um, painful depression and anxiety among young adults. And this is kind of global. It's, it's, it's acute in the United States. 18 to 25 year olds have over a 30% rate of mental health issues today. It's an alarming moment. And one of those background realities of that is that people are constantly comparing themselves in a digital virtual world with everybody else. And they are always falling short. How do we, how do we, instill a different way of thinking about, about human diversity and about something about the richness of that diversity that isn't about always defaulting to a presumption of perfection. Jay, help us think that through. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's big. Um, but um, I, think, I think it's a matter of, uh, it makes you a better designer. Like if you're training, and you're considering different bodies, different abilities, just like the range of humans, um, then you're, everything is going to be better designed. You know, everything's good. I mean, I, you were mentioning about, oh, I think Sinead was saying earlier about, um, uh, you know, you could, it could be accidental. And I just took a trip. I was just in the UK. I had hurt my leg. Um, and finding accessible lifts and, get, I mean, especially the tube, um, everything was so so challenging and uh and and like has been said by a few people it made me feel like really sort of like it was it wasn't a consideration so i always felt i felt i was apologizing constantly to everybody i was with <laughs> um and i think i i think if if more things were designed so that they were just part of the landscape you know just a normal uh, approach to it um and more people were considered throughout that process and not othered. And, you know, I think there's definitely a place for specialty, like where you really understand that market, a particular market, and you're focusing and you're, you know, you're, you're exploring that. But I think for designers who don't necessarily have a specialty yet, you know, for students especially, they just need to consider all the factors, you know, just the way they need to consider different body types, um, you know, different places around the world where people wear fashion, you know, just like all these different elements into their their process. I think that's left out. I think that right now, I mean, the when a syllabus says, you know, ideal figure, it, it just it, that part of it is so, so daunting because, you know, you have these fig these ideals being perpetuated by the magazines and everything. And you, they, they're attracted to that. You know, it seems so glamorous. And then to make it, but I, th but I'm finding that more and more of these design students are wanting to. Uh, they're finding that pleasure and excitement in designing for everyone. You know, to really consider making it accessible. But um, and then when you mentioned the social media and this idea of of not measuring up the one little bit of advice that I give my students, because I, I think social media is kind of just a given, there's no way of saying we have, you know, you can't go back, you can't put the genie in the model. But I always say to them, use it in a different way, use it as a feed for information, don't worry about your participation so much on it, and how people, you know, how many likes you get. But it's more about, um, remember the old ticker tape, where you get news, you know, and that's the way I treat it, you know, so and, and some of them have adopted that, you know, they take it for gathering information and getting to see the world and seeing art and, you know, not not being so worried about it being um, a value judgment when they put things out on there in the world. So. Rebecca, you've given some thought to the idea of TikTok and storytelling for people with disabilities, um, that it's become an avenue for really easy um, aha moments to be delivered very simply. Can you can you talk about the role, the positive role um, that we're seeing kind of blossoming every year? 
Yes, yes. Thank you for the question. Um, yes, as you both were talking about the social media piece, I, I always feel um, so much conflict around the both and of social media because some <laughs> of the things that you named, Valerie, about the harms are real and undeniable and powerful. Um, but I also have experienced firsthand the exact opposite of that within the same space. I, I've, I've experienced both, right? But I have also experienced the opposite of that. Um, and I will note, I'm not cool enough to be on TikTok. I'm intimidated by TikTok. So I mostly occupy Instagram. My husband will give me all the TikTok news when he, you know, uh, debriefs me at the end of the day. But um, I'm mostly on Instagram. And um, what I find is incredibly valuable about that space um, is the opportunity for people to tell their own stories without any gatekeepers. Um, um, so the authentic personal storytelling of that space um, or the opportunity for that kind of um, storytelling. I think, as I mentioned before, everything comes back to storytelling. And I think so much of our narrative around um, who we want to be, who is a successful person, who is a beautiful person, who um, has made it, who is um, um, doing well at this thing of life has to do with stories that we have about human beings. And I think um, for so long, I mean, hundreds of years, disabled people have had their stories told for them. Um, and these lives have been um, kind of narrowed or our perception of these lives has been narrowed through that kind of um, storytelling narrowed and belittled and minimized and skewed and misrepresented. And so I think when people have a chance to tell their own stories, um, to be in charge of what photograph is taken and, and, is, and posted and shared and um, what's included in that photograph, I'm thinking about for me, um, including my wheelchair in a beautiful portrait of myself, right? right? Not cropping it out or getting out of my chair and sitting in another chair, but including that in the totality of who I am and what I want to show the world and make and showing that as beautiful um, is really powerful. And I think another piece of that storytelling, um, and I experienced this firsthand, is that a lot of people who grow up um, with disabilities don't grow up having those people right next door to them or in their families often or um, at, in their classes. And so being able to find people from around the globe in this space that you would not have known otherwise. Um, and seeing other people with these, with a disability show up to that space, it's so much, it was so much easier for me to under, to see the beauty in those people and understand the value of those people in the world that it translated to how I saw myself. Um, and so I think having this uh, space where we get to show up and find each other and tell our stories and see each other in our stories is an undeniably powerful force as well. And we are seeing the momentum of that. And um, we're seeing people pay attention um, to this group in a new way. And I think it's, it's completely undeniable that social media is a huge part of the reason why um, that this group has um, sort of begun to reclaim a narrative and assert that into the world and claim um, a community and um, in that space. And so I, I, I can't talk about social media without always looking at the both end of it. And I feel a lot of angst about it. And honestly, and someone occupying that space, it's difficult to know um, how to hold on to all of the best parts and put away the parts that are hard and harmful. Um, but it's, it's not going back in the box, right? This is out here in the world. And so figuring out how to hold on to the beauty of that and take advantage of the beauty of that and the power of that um, is, is, is what I think about a lot. I think about that tool a lot. Um, so, yeah. Thank you, Thank you Rebecca. Awesome. Well done. Um, do you want to take that next? Yes. Um... This question is from Dr. Kimberly. I am Dr. Kimberly Barrington, a wheelchair user for 10 years. I'm a, vertical, I'm a vertical half pelagic who has created a couture clothing line. How do I connect to get it manufactured? We're probably looking to Sinead, who is inside the fashion world in a particular way. I was also going to say that... Uh, 
connecting with Meta San um, is probably very useful too in terms of thinking about it. Um, Kimberly, it's wonderful to hear about your line and specifically that it's couture. In terms of getting it manufactured, I guess I have more questions than answers. Would be happy to have a call with you after this session. I've shared my email address. I think my question will be in terms of getting it manufactured, is your idea a collaboration or a partnership with, for example, a high street retailer? Is it about a partnership with a luxury fashion company? Do you want your own line or brand? Uh, is it something that you want to kind of set up and be a designer in-house for an organization? A little bit of clarity would be something we could absolutely discuss. And I think that would then help map the next steps in terms of getting it manufactured. Thank you, Sinead. Sinead, I want to ask you, well, while you're right there, I want to ask you a question about someone that I think you have a very special relationship with, and that is Edward Enenfell. Mm -hmm. And would you just tell people who he is? Because I am currently reading his biography, and this is a great, great storyteller. And I think his ability to envision himself in the life he really wanted um, is the tool he uses to transform how we think about fashion. And he's been, I know he's been your partner. Tell us about the remarkable role of catalyst of Edward Enenfeld, but tell us who he is first, please. Sure, Edward Enenfeld is the editor-in-chief of British Vogue and also has a title as European editor, editorial director, which means the editors and the kind of content managers of the various different European editions of Vogue report into him and he supports the overall content strategy, but he is known as the editor-in-chief of British Vogue, most of all. My understanding is that he is the first Black man in that role and really came at a time in which conversations around racism, ableism, ageism within fashion was really permeating. His background is as a stylist, as a fashion director, and is really a cultural convener within the fashion system overall. I had the great privilege of meeting Edward some time ago. Gosh, I think it may have been 20, maybe even 2018, 2019. I was invited to a Burberry fashion show. It was one of the first fashion shows that I'd ever been to. I, of course, got there ridiculously early. Um, because I was so excited and so terrified. I didn't know how any of these things worked. I didn't know that they start late. I didn't know that you have your own seat and that's where you have to sit. And it was, I was full of nervousness. And just as the show was about to start, somebody kind of raced in and they ended up sitting beside me. And I turned and it was Edward and he had only just been appointed editor-in-chief of British Vogue. I texted a really good friend of mine at the time and said, oh my gosh, I didn't say that. I used a swear word, but I'll be polite in this environment. Edward Enfull is sitting beside me, what do I do? And for the entirety of the fashion show, it was beautiful, but I could not concentrate on the collection. All I kept wanting to think about is what am I going to say to Edward? So at the end of the show, I tugged on the sleeve of his jacket. He turned around and I introduced myself. I said, hi, my name is Sinead. I think what you're doing in fashion is incredibly important. I wanted to know if you were bringing in disability as part of this conversation. He invited me to his office in Vogue. We had a back and forth and multiple conversations. I got to participate and become a contributing editor of British Vogue and got to be part of their Vogue 25, which is a list of influential women. I had no idea what that conversation would move and bring to. Of course, the 2019 issue that I spoke about. But actually, I think my most powerful moment in my relationship with Edward and in his own journey is that as part of the reframing fashion issue in 2023, he self-identified as disabled around his blood condition, around his visual disability, and even talking to it and using the language of disability. And I think, and Rebecca spoke to this so beautifully, you know, sometimes we don't know whether or not people are disabled or if they self-identify as disabled. And disability in itself is a journey. We may not be disabled today, but we may be tomorrow. And I think the more that we have disabled people in leadership positions within the fashion system, the quicker, the faster, the more intentional things will change. And I look at Edward's own journey as a disabled queer man and a disabled queer black man. And I think about the impact that his lived experience had on the issue that we got to do together and in the continued dialogue around disability and fashion in Vogue. Uh, and I think he's a, 
a really extraordinary person. And I cannot wait to see what he does next, because if the audience doesn't know, he is leaving his role as editor in chief of British Vogue. May 2024 will be his last issue as editor in chief. He will still hold some role within Vogue. Um, but I also think it's a lovely mark that on the anniversary of our disability issue, that is going to be his last issue as EIC. But I can't wait to see what he does next. If you have not read or listened to his book, I would really recommend it. I'll second that. I second that. Um, I, I just a just a question for Aaron because Aaron, you you had a vision. You were driven. You were passionate. Was there somebody that was the most significant person to make this dream real for you? Was there somebody who heard you and could understand your vision? Yeah, you know, we're trying to figure out where do the where do the points of opportunity show up? Who are those people? Um, who was who was your person? Did you have an individual or did you just keep plugging along and finding whomever you could who could hear and share your vision? There are so many ways I can answer that question, Valerie. Honestly, there are so many different ways I can answer that question. Um, I'm going to start with saying that. Um, hold on. Can you still see or hear me? Yes. Yeah. Fine. OK, beautiful. Um, there are so many different ways I can answer that question. And I think that um, it wasn't one person that helped me get to the point in my life that I'm at in terms of being able to sort of even talk about my role as a disabled person in the fashion industry or why I have done what I've done or why I wanted to do what I've done. Um, there are so many different people I can list off the top of my head, but I'm gonna try to logically explain like in terms of my career, who has been the most supportive and influential as to like, who really saw me. Um, I want to start off with saying that when I started my fashion journey and um, when I was, um, cause you know, as a young disabled youth and as a queer youth, especially, um, I feel in a lot of ways as a fashion was not really made for me. And you know, the, the traditional way of applying to a modeling agency, um, that wasn't something that was accessible to me. You know, I couldn't go to the casting calls or the go sees because they were not looking for disabled talent. They were never having myself or other disabled talent in mind. So I was really driven to become a model because I figured that the most effective way to see the change that I wanted to see in fashion as someone who loved fashion would be to literally inhabit the role of being a model as a wheelchair user, as a black trans woman, as you know, somebody who deeply loved and cared about fashion and wanted to work hard, that's where I figured it would be the best kind of like space and um, role to take up in fashion. And so when I was younger, um, I was a high schooler and um, I took it upon myself at first to like literally submit online to all the modeling agencies I possibly could and write really detailed essays about who I was, why fashion mattered to me and you know, I even, you know, I was in high school, I had limited resources, so I would have my own professional and aid as I was in high school, like, take my digital in the school courtyard, so I could submit to agencies and show people, like, I really cared about fashion, I really wanted to inhabit this role of model to see the change that I wanted to see and create. Um, I was very serious, and then what happened is um, social media was a huge catalyst for how I was able to be discovered and understood by several communities. Um, my fellow disabled community, my trans community, um, my fashion community. That's where I was mostly seen and heard, social media. Social media was the biggest, honestly, the biggest um, catalyst for how I was able to even be understood. And it gave me my voice more than anything at all. But um, honestly, it's been a combination of a lot of things. I attribute, I attribute my, I mean, I attribute my family as supporters of what, what I have done to the maximum, um, they really encouraged me, especially as a, I guess, societally disempowered youth to empower myself as much as possible, to make myself clear, open, and heard as much as possible. Um, they really empowered me to do that. Um, I'm gonna honestly share a story. Um, Hunter Schaefer, actress and um, former high fashion model, um, Hunter Schaefer is someone in my life um, who 
has been really influential to me because Hunter Schaefer and I, many years and eons ago, it feels like, but not even really, um, Hunter Schaefer is and was in a very incredible friend to me. And, you know, we were connected by our transness, by our connection of transness in the community. And Hunter Schaefer had been working at Elite Model Management, our former agency, our former model agency for quite some time. And um, Hunter was incredibly generous and kind and loving and wonderful. And um, Hunter knew about my aspirations to be a model and why it was so important to me. So Hunter took it upon herself to send an email to my now agent who used to work at Elite about me and um, why I was doing what I was doing. And Hunter helped to set up a meeting with the agency that I used to be at. And um, that's how I was connected to my agent today, Richie Keo. And um, that was extremely influential because I think that without Hunter's support in that moment, I think, we, I think it would have been much harder to be able to get to the point that I'm out of achieving representation. I had, I had multiple goals in my um, fashion career journey at that point. I, I knew that if I wanted to break into high fashion because I already was experiencing such um, understanding and success in retail fashion because retail understood, um, understands that fashion is something that everybody can be a part of. But high fashion had a lot less understanding of that. And Hunter understood me for that. So Hunter introduced me to my agency so that they could represent me in the ways that I wanted to be represented to clients. And um, by the grace of God and through Hunter's love and support, um, that worked out for me. And um, to this day, um, I attribute so much thanks and love to Hunter for what she had done because Hunter is such a star. And um, not only is she a star, she's one of the kindest people I've ever known. So I attribute a lot of thanks to her. Um, but when I really think about it, so many different people have helped, you know, bring me to the point that I am where I'm able to be here today and share my story, but also, you know, aspire to be the best fashion model I can be. Um, there's so much work to do in fashion and especially in high fashion in terms of how disabled people are perceived and understood and how much we can work. Um, I think that a lot of the high fashion industry misunderstands that um, disabled people can contribute to high fashion just like anyone else can if you give us the accommodations and the resources to. Um, this is what I always say in terms of wanting to book runway, which is my biggest goal. I'm, I want to be a runway, a full-time runway model. I'm still waiting to have um, a full fashion month where I'm able to do multiple shows in multiple cities throughout the whole fashion month of September. Um, I've been working for five years for that goal. So all I can really do is advocate and do the work to continue to get to that point. But um, so many people and so many things have attributed to why I'm able to be the person that I am today. And for that, I am so grateful. Hey, Ron, thanks so much. Um, it, Thank it's you hard so to much. believe that people wouldn't line up to do anything they could, given um, given your obvious personality, your level of excitement and enthusiasm has got to be contagious. Um, oh, thank I'm you just, so much. <laughs> I, I want to ask just before we close today, if, if I could just ask if, if, if anybody has a pressing comment that they want to make, if anybody just feels like you can kind of wrap this a bit. Um, and we'll we'll certainly have Sinead close our our conversation today as our uh, as our guest. But um, other people, other people have anything that they'd like to share. I mean, Rebecca is a great storyteller. Jay is a mentor and leader, and um, has had enormous influence over people's lives. Anybody got some last thoughts? I mean, I think what we want to do is make sure that the ideas we've shared today um, have traction. You know that they they continue that they they grow they seed other other opportunities. I just one quick thing because I wish I had been taking notes the whole time um, is the idea of um, like taking this like spreading the word basically you know taking hold of the messages sharing you know I've already researched all the other panelists before you know just looked into everybody and and and. I think it's really important to not just feel good about the fact that you're doing something, but really kind of share it and, and pay it forward so that, again, me with my students or just even audiences, whenever you have a platform or an audience to 
expose people to this because I think once people hear the stories, like it, it just makes it it makes it more real, and it just you you wonder why you weren't thinking about this to begin with. So I just think continuing to share messages and stories and making it real for everybody is really important. Thank you, Jay. Others. I'll just add one quick thought. I, I think, sorry, my cat is so loud at lunchtime. Um, that's my cat, <laughs> not my toddler. Um, one quick, quick thing uh, I would just add is I think so often in conversations about inclusion, um, particularly with disability inclusion, it, 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 the conversation can be framed as like, we need to do this because it's the kinder thing to do or the, um, it's, um, it's, it's a, it's a kindness to these people that we would come and include them. And I would just want to underscore the thought that like, maybe that's part of it, but also it's better. It's, it's a, um, it's a richer way of being in the world. Like I, I felt like looking at the cover of Vogue and seeing Aron Rose and seeing Sinead on that cover was like, this is, this is cooler. This is better. This is more interesting. It's not a favor. It's um, this is uh, the future. This is a uh, this is what we want to move toward. And so I guess I would just underscore this is not a favor. This is not kindness. I mean, maybe, but it, this is better. Um, so just want to underscore that thought. Oh, Jess, you wanted to. You know. Yeah, I'll I'll be quick. Um, with the recent um, overture of affirmative action in the states. Um, six senior leaders in DEI um, work throughout Hollywood and media have stepped down from their position of power. And I feel like despite how disheartening everything can feel in present times, conversations like this bring hope. Um, and the talent that everyone at this discussion has brought to the table, um, Shanae offering visibility on how infrastructures inside and out can be more inclusive. Um, Mighty San pro providing an example of how fashion can service both the care receiver and the caregiver. Um, Rebecca with emphasizing the power of storytelling and representation. Jay with mentorship and the hope that uh, a new changing of the guard can, can inspire and bring more light and Aaron Aaron um Rose baby I fell in love with you in 2018 when I saw you at ASOS my little brother and he's not but he's seen and responded very well and like all of you um represents so much and although fashion can sometimes be underwritten as just clothes it represents and communicates so much more um so again thank you for being open to having this discussion with us today beautiful thank you jess Sinead, last word our friend who uh gave us such a generous amount of her time and attention and serious commitment today last word my friend Gosh, um, I think Jess really rounded us out. You know, for me, the reason why fashion is important is because it is the only industry that we all legally have to interact with and that we all have to wear clothes, even when working from home, hopefully, if you're on Zoom. And clothes touches our skin. And I think every person who works in fashion serves that purpose, be it legal, be it HR. But in terms of thinking about next steps, for me, I think where radical systemic change is going to come from is by disabled people being in the room, whether that is on a runway at a fashion show, whether that's in a design studio. I think where I want to see change move to is not just thinking about representation in models and in storytellers and in photographers, though that is very important. I want to see disabled designers. I want to see disabled creative directors. And some of the challenge around getting creative directors to be disabled is a lack of access to education and design education. At Tilting Lens, we have a very exciting announcement coming in October to try to create new processes and ways and funded opportunities for disabled people to get access to fashion design education. But if I could encourage everybody, this talk and this seminar today for two hours has been extraordinary, but this is not the work. The work happens the minute we leave this call. I would ask you to continuously ask, is this accessible? If you're going to dinner tonight, ask the restaurant, is this accessible? They say yes, ask them what do they mean? 
because it's usually not. Is it step-free access? Is there a hearing loop? Is there an accessible bathroom? And then continuously ask yourself who's not in the room. We may not be able to see or have all disabilities visible, but if we arm, arm ourselves with those two questions, I really fundamentally believe we can move from just awareness to action. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sinead. Uh, and I want to just let everyone know that uh, we will edit the captions from today, and this will become a, a webcast available for anyone to download. Uh, it'll be linked from our website, and it'll be on YouTube. So thank you, and thanks our pr production staff, um, our, our interpreter at Joyful Signing, uh, uh, our our Keen producer PJ Moynihan, who always produces our material, and Annie Cow, who has been manning the desk just a few feet from us, um, who has been invaluable to getting this off the ground. So thanks to all. Um, be well. <laughs>